day. Emma's in the office. She runs our editorial team. And Shawnee's sitting here with this big thing of chips and just watching and eating chips. But anyway, my name is Mark Lamonica. I look after the individual investor team for Morningstar here in Australia. And today we're going to talk about alternative investments. So before we get into it, Anything you hear today is general advice. I don't know anything about you, so I can't offer personal advice, but would like some questions, so send them through. If you're in New Zealand, you get a copy of our FAP from morningstar.com.au. And you should visit a financial advisor if you would like personal advice. Johnny is over there cracking up. At I do not know what. All right, let's get into it. So we're going to talk about alternative investments. I think this one will be on the quicker side, but obviously ask any questions you have. All right, so what are we talking about with alternative investments? So we have traditional investments, traditional investments, and there is some confusing part of, parts of this and some interlap between these two uh, these two circles. But yeah, really what we're talking about is Long only, so that means going long is just buying an asset. Long only funds, ETFs, and individual investments in equities and bonds and cash. That's sort of what we call the traditional realm of investments. And then, of course, we have the alternative side. Now, we'll go through a couple of these. I won't go through every single one. Um, you know, the one thing that I would say is that. And we'll talk about this a lot today. Alternative investments have become increasingly popular. So in 2016, the assets under management, so the assets invested in alternative assets, was $10.1 trillion US. It's expected to grow to $21 million, $21 trillion in 2025. So a lot of people are becoming increasingly interested in alternative assets. So let's talk about what some of these big categories are. Um, and there are certainly similarities between, uh, between both. And there's no real definition of alternative assets. Um, we'll go through a couple of examples. So one example, we'll talk about hedge funds. So hedge funds is a term we hear a lot. Now, originally hedge funds came out because they were hedging risk. And the way that they hedged risk is they did that because they were able to short securities. So going short on a security means that you basically sell the security, you borrow it from somebody, you sell it, which means that you benefit if the price goes down. Because at some point you have to go into the open market, buy it and give it back to the person you borrowed it from. So you want that price to go down. Now, the way that the reason that these were called hedge funds is going short something gives you the ability to hedge risk. So what you'll hear about with hedge funds are long short portfolios, where they're going long some securities, and then they're going short other securities. And of course, you are actually hedging something there. So I'll give a very simple example. So and there's all sorts of complex strategies. But one way you might do that is you could look at pair trades. So that's not pairs. You're not trading for pairs. Nobody really likes pairs, I don't think. You are finding two companies that are very similar. So a simple example would be Coke and Pepsi. Uh, an example would be potentially the banks in Australia, right? You could pick Commonwealth and Westpac. And you do analysis on this pair trade, and you decide one is better than the other. So you decide you think the Commonwealth Bank is going to outperform Westpac. So what do you do? You go long ComBank, you go short Westpac. So what this does, what it's designed to do, it's designed to remove market risk and general industry and sector risk. Right, So this is an example of hedging away those risks. Now, you're not going to fully remove them, but you're able to hedge those away. And the only thing you care about, if this is your entire portfolio, where you were long CBA and short Westpac, the only thing you care about is their relative performance. Right, So you will win if Westpac goes down 95% and CBA goes down 90%. 
you will still make money in that scenario, right? So that is how you have hedged away market risk and you've hedged away, in this case, banking sector risk, right? Like the Australian banks, obviously you're not gonna be great if they go out of business, but if Australian banks all do terrible, all you're locking in is that relative performance. So that's a hedge fund. A hedge fund is was originally set up because in mutual funds in the US, you were not allowed to short securities. So hedge funds were introduced. Now, tricky thing about hedge funds is they've evolved a lot. Now there's all sorts of different styles of hedge funds. You could have a long only hedge fund in theory. And then really the only thing that makes it an alternative asset is the fact that you have a different fee structure. So that's one form. Then we have things such as private equity and venture capital. So what are those? Well, now we're starting to look at private companies. Everything that we invest in in the share market is by definition public because they've gone public and you can go buy their shares. Um, private equity could take public companies, private. It can buy divisions of companies, but they are no longer traded. They're held private. Venture capital, we're looking at very early stages, right? Funding those early companies. Collectibles, I don't know why Shani put collectibles on there, um, but yeah, I guess an alternative asset, you can invest in wine or action figures. I don't know what other collectibles you have, baseball cards. Um, so commodity investments are considered um, alternative real estate, et cetera. Okay, so we're not gonna go through the definition of everything, but what we are gonna talk about is why you would use them in your portfolio. All right. So there are a couple of characteristics of alternative investments that made them exciting for investors. So we have an early question. Antique cars. Rodney says antique cars because they're exempt from CGT. Okay, well, you heard it here first from Rodney. Antique cars. Um, so Lisa wants me to explain long short again because I probably did a pretty terrible job. So basically, think of a short position. So a short position in this case. So we'll go back to my example, CBA and Westpac. I am short Westpac. I am long CBA. So literally the mechanics of how shorting a share works is that you borrow shares. So you borrow shares from generally like an institutional investor. So you might hear sometimes um, a term called security lending. So security lending is a way that um, institutional investors can make money. So we're just going down a rabbit hole of long short, but anyway, security lending. So there are ETFs in the US, for example, that have 0% fees. So you pay zero management fee. Now, why would a company do that? Well, they'd only do it if there are ways to make profits. And one of the ways that investors, the companies behind an ETF, for example, one of the ways that they might do this is security lending. So if you think about an ETF, the ETF, if it's tracking an index, there will be no change to certain securities, right? If you're tracking the S&P 500, Apple's not going out of the index, right? It's tracking the top 500 shares in the US. Apple is number one in terms of the most valuable and the biggest share. So it would have to fall literally 500 spaces to 500 companies would have to get above Apple in terms of market capitalization for it to be kicked out of the index. So it's not going anywhere. So the ETF provider knows that they will have Apple. So they could loan those Apple shares out. Um, so they, that is security lending and they get a fee for that. So they loan those shares out to someone who wants to short the company. So you have borrowed the shares, just like if I borrowed Shawnee's chips right now, she's finished them, so I can't borrow them. She wouldn't give them to me anyway. If I borrowed her chips, well, I need to give her back chips, right? So she bought them from downstairs. We're really going off the deep end on this one. <laughs> She bought them from downstairs um, at the canteen. So I would say, okay, Shani, I want to take your chips. I will give you some chips back later. If I went down there and the price had changed on the chips, then I could either make money or lose money on this, right? Because I borrowed something at a certain value. I've sold it. So in this case, I've sold Shani's chips for $2. I go down and they're a dollar. This is the worst example ever. If I go down and they're a dollar, then I will make money. So anyway, 
you want shares to fall because at some point you need to go buy them back from the market and return them from the person that you borrowed them from. Um, so hopefully that helps a little bit, Lisa. That is that is shorting. So when you go long short, you were long some positions. That's what most of us are as investors. If I go buy Apple shares, I'm long Apple. So I benefit if Apple goes up. You go short some different positions. And you could do things, you could do all sorts of different pair trades if you wanted. You could go long the S&P 500, short the NASDAQ. So what are you betting? You're just betting the S&P 500 will outperform. So that could be like an absolute return strategy that you're just trying to make money in any market condition. Because it doesn't matter if both fall, it doesn't matter if both go up, it's just the relative performance between the two. Um, I wish there was a rewind button so I could go back and not give that chip example. Um, so why do people buy alternative investments? Low correlation to traditional investments. So let's talk about correlation. So when you are putting together a portfolio, and this is not generally something you'd have to worry about as an individual investor with a long time horizon, but you could worry about this if there were periods of volatility and you did not want volatility. So like if you were going into retirement and you didn't want your portfolio to bounce around, you were looking at assets that have low correlation. So low correlation means that um, if one asset goes up, it really has no impact on the other one, whether it's going to go up or down. If you're actually negatively correlated, that other asset, if one goes up, one will go down. Um, so we measure correlations over time, like stocks and bonds, for example. It's the example that people always give with diversification, which is actually wrong, that the reason you have shares and bonds in your portfolio is because when shares go up in price, bonds will go down. When shares go down in price, bonds will go up. It's actually completely wrong. Um, but anyway, that's what people say. But that is that example, which doesn't make much sense. That example is low correlation. So what people are looking for with these alternative investments is to add assets to their portfolio that have lower correlation. And since we're we're being all technical today, you know, with the chip example, what you're trying to do as an investor that's trying to fill a portfolio with assets that don't have a lot of correlation with each other is there's this thing called the efficient frontier where you're basically trying to figure out the place where you get the most return with the least amount of risk, that risk being volatility. Um, so yeah, hopefully that uh, hopefully that makes sense. We have lots of questions. I wonder if they're all about the chips. Um, okay, good point by Rodney. Uh, hot chips or packet version? Hot chips. If they're hot chips, they could, yeah, the risk could be they could turn into cold chips and have less value. But it's a good comment, Simon, but we have a microwave here. So I don't know if Shawnee would pick up on, she said she'd pick up on it. Okay. So Rodney's saying one thing, and I sort of added this around shorting. One of the problems with shorting is that if you go long a share, so you go out and buy Apple, you have unlimited returns on the upside, right? Apple could keep going up in price and price and price and price, which is a good thing you have a limit on the downside. Because if I go and buy an Apple share, I don't, they're like trading for 145 bucks or something like that, I think. If you go and buy an Apple share right now, the most you can lose is $145, if that's what the price is of the share. So the worst thing that can happen to you as an investor is it goes to zero. But you can earn thousands and thousands of percent on the upside. So I, over the long term, Going long is a good thing. Problem is when you short something, the exact opposite happens. So you have limited upside. So if I shorted Apple and it was $145 a share, the most I could possibly make would be $145. That Apple goes bankrupt and it goes to zero. And then it's great for me because I've sold these shares that I borrowed and now they're worthless. So I don't have to give them back because they have zero value. Um, the problem is your losses, you lose money on shorting when the price goes up of the share. So you have unlimited losses. It's why people get very, is why there's a lot of controls in place around shorting. 
Um, it's why originally it was not allowed in mutual funds or US version to manage funds. Um, that's the issue with shorting. It can be very dangerous. So if we go back to around this time last year, and this is another little aside, but hopefully a more valuable one than the chip discussion. Um, last year, we heard about GameStop. So what was happening? A bunch of hedge funds shorted it. And then a bunch of retail investors on chat boards and everything else, and frankly, a lot of hedge funds too, but we don't like to talk about that in this David versus Goliath story. Um, so what happened there? Well, they inflated the price of the stock. Everyone went there and bought it. Price started going up. So what do the hedge funds have to do? The hedge funds had to get more capital because you have basically the equivalent of a margin call when you shorted something because the people that have lent it to you are starting to get really worried that like, are you going to have enough money to buy this thing back as it keeps going up in price? Um, so that's a very good point, Rodney. So thank you for that. It allowed us collectively to move on from that chip, um, that chip incident. Uh, and Simon says collectibles could also be NFTs. Yeah, exactly. So if you want to buy your little gorilla picture, that can be a collectible. So when did alternative investments really take off? Well, they really took off with something called the um, Yale Endowment Model. Um, so basically, there's this guy named Dave Swenson at Yale, and Dave Swenson was in charge of Yale's endowment. And he started thinking about investing in an endowment, what it is. So an endowment is simply, um, you know, a pool of money that is used to support an institution. So in this case, Yale University in Connecticut. And an endowment is supposed to last forever. So when we talk about long-term investing, like if you're going to retire in 30 years, well, that's a long time period, but forever is a really long time period. And the endowment just has to kick off a certain amount of money each year. And then that money is used to support the university. So he started thinking about this. And at that time, endowments were invested the same way we would invest. They bought shares and bonds and they had some cash. And he started thinking, why am I just investing in all these liquid investments? So a liquid investment is something that can easily be converted to cash, right? So that's a share, right? So yeah, can't trade it all day, but while the market's open five days a week, I can very easily convert that to cash. Same thing with the bond market. So those are liquid investments. And he started thinking, but I don't need this money potentially forever, at least a portion of it, right? I can see, keep some cash. I'll use that cash to pay off what I need to pay to the university every year to support their operations. But I can let this thing just go forever. So he started thinking, well, what if I start investing in illiquid assets? And illiquid assets, a lot of them are on this alternative asset, um, this alternative asset wheel. So for instance, private equity and venture capital are illiquid assets. So when you sign up as an investor in private equity, you are giving the private equity company your money for a long time and stipulated how long that money is going to them. Because of course, they need to take that money they need to find a private or find a company to buy in its entirety and take it private. Then they need to do something to make a profit off of that um, off of that company. So they either need to load it up with debt, pay out a big dividend to themselves, restructure it, sell it. They need to, as what private equity people always say, is they're there to improve the company. They need time to improve the company. Then they need to find another buyer and sell it for its worth. Either way, you can't get your money out because your money is in this private company. Because it's private, there's no way to sell it. There's no way to get your money back. So that's a, an illiquid investment. So investors traditionally didn't really like these. Um, and same thing with venture capital, right? You know, they need to invest in a very young, you know, two guys in a garage type of thing. Um, wait till the company goes public, which could be years. Um, it's the same thing. They're illiquid investments. And so what Dave Swenson started thinking is, okay, there's actually a liquidity premium out in the market, meaning that from a valuation standpoint, there is a premium to liquid assets because investors like that. 
makes people feel you know, safe at night that they can get their money back at any time. They start to sell their shares. So he said, well, if I don't care about liquidity, why am I paying a premium? And the premium in the valuation, the higher valuation, means that your returns are lower, right? That's what higher valuations mean. If you go buy a share at a higher valuation, your returns over time are probably going to be lower. They will be lower than if you buy something at a low valuation. Um, so he said, I have this very long, you know, very long investment horizon. And so I'll put a bunch of money into private investments and illiquid investments. So private equity and venture capital and real estate, like real estate, not buying a real estate investment trust, but real estate, like I'm going to buy a building, right? It's not easy to sell a building. It takes some time if you want to sell it. Um, timber. So timberland, not the wrapper or the boots, but, you know, a big piece of land where you grow timber and harvest trees. That's a very long life asset, right? Because you have to wait for the tree to grow so you can chop it down, do whatever you do with the wood, and then grow another tree, right? So he thought these are all uncorrelated assets where there is a premium um, from a return standpoint because they're illiquid, right? So this was the Yale model. And David Swenson did very, very well. So what happened? Everyone copied him. Um, so that's what we do, right? Somebody does well, everybody copies him. So he unfortunately died last year, uh, maybe the year before, uh, at a pretty young age, which was older than me, but you know, still young. Um, anyway, everyone copied them. So private investments, as I said before, these alternative investments are very, very popular now for all sorts of reasons. But one reason, of course, returns have been better. And whether we're looking at this liquidity, illiquidity difference, the returns have been a lot better. So guess what? Just like we talk about how retail investors, individual investors chase returns, all of these supposedly you know, brilliant, rational institutional investors have done the same thing. So they put more and more money into alternative investments. And you're seeing this in Australia as well, right? If you look at these large industry super funds, more and more of them are going into alternative investments, right? We just had this week, Sydney Airport purchased by this consortium, including like Aussie Super. That is a private equity deal, right? That they're all doing. They're taking a public company private. Um, and whatever they do with Sydney Airport, we'll see but that's what they did. So you're getting all this money flowing in there. And the interesting thing that happened is all of a sudden this difference between you know, what you were getting paid um, in extra returns by holding illiquid assets has basically disappeared. So a lot of people are writing now about how no longer are liquid assets um, something that have lower expected returns because so much money has flown into private equity, things like that, but the valuation levels have gone up. So now we've got valuation levels on private companies that are actually higher than corresponding public companies. So it's a screwy world we live in for all sorts of reasons, but that's one as well. All right, let's keep moving through here because I said this would be quick and we got bogged down in the chip story. Um, all right. So another reason that people have turned to um, private assets or alternative assets, of course, is because of returns. So with really low yields, and we've talked about this a lot, bonds are pretty unattractive. With really high valuation levels, that also makes equities pretty unattractive on a go forward basis. So investors are searching for returns. So that's another reason that they are looking. And I would say the other thing that, that is interesting, right? So very low interest rates, of course, you know, are good for bonds as they fall, but not great when they're really low. But borrowing really cheaply helps out a lot of these alternative assets. Um, so it certainly helps out private equity and venture capital um, because a lot of times they are, um, especially private equity, they're buying these companies and loading them up with debt. So, you know, they used to call private e equity leveraged buyouts, 
but then it got this bad rap in the 80s. Um, there was that whole book, Barbarians of the Gate, about it, about RGR Nabisco um, and KKR. So that's the private equity company. So anyway, leverage buyouts, got a bad rap, so they just renamed them private equity. Sounds much more sophisticated, right? So I feel like you could wear you know, a fleece vest and hang out in the Greenwich Country Club, talk about how you were in private equity. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, Shine's just making fun of me. There are weird Connecticut references, so sorry. Um, so Lisa is saying, Tina, so there is no alternative, is now Tina EA. There is no alternative except alternatives. I like that, Lisa. That was really good. Um, yeah, that was really good. So this is kind of what's happening with alternative investments. So let's uh, let's talk about some of the different categories that we have around liquid alternatives, because this is something that, in general, you can access as an individual investor. Some of the other things are pretty hard to access. Um, and I'm personally skeptical of, you know, it's that Rodney Dangerfield quote that like, I don't want to belong to any club that would let me in. I'd be pretty worried. I'm worried about a lot of these in general, where they are offering these investments to individual investors, because of course, like, why would you do that? If you were the top private equity manager, you wouldn't bother. Um, you just go out and raise huge amounts of institutional money. Um, but anyway, that's just me. I'm pretty skeptical. So yeah, there's there's a couple different sides of these liquid alternatives, but you can get uh, you can get access, <laughs> you can get access to them. Um, but yeah, we've got more traditional, and so these are modifiers of portfolios. So this is what people use for down uh, for protection in downturns. So. What do we have? Long short equity, as I said, right? Long short equity can remove market risk. So you don't care if the market goes up or down. Um, derivative income. So basically derivative income involves options and involves option strategies that give you income. Um, and so basically what you're doing is you can protect yourself from the downside. So if the market goes down, it's instead of buying a put, you're selling one. Um, non-traditional flexible bond. So there are all sorts of bonds, right? A bond is a contract at the end of the day, um, but issued in a issued in bond form. There are different things that you can do around bonds. Um, yeah, in terms of in terms of allocation, um, being more flexible, um, more tactical instead of strategic and long term. There are ways that you can move around your asset allocation that hopefully will protect you in a downturn. And you can simply do things like you can buy an inverse ETF, right? An ETF that goes up in price when the market goes down. Once again, very risky, but something you can do. And then we've got, Shani, you put a lot of, Shani created these slides. You put a lot of different stuff on these slides. Yeah, no, you should apologize. Uh, I don't go through all of them. Diversifiers, okay, so what are you using a diversifier for? You're using it for risk management. Um, so yeah, I don't go through all these relative value arbitrage, all of these things basically at the end of the day, if used correctly, are going to give you some sort of upside if the market goes down. Um, and then opportunistic, so macro. So macro just means they can do whatever they want. Um, you have these macro hedge funds that say, we'll invest in anything anywhere around the world where we see an opportunity. Um, so anyway, some different some different options for you. Jeez, Shani, I'm not gonna go through. I'm not gonna go through all of these. So I think the I think the problem with um, I think the problem with alternatives is right here, this slide, which I like, is as an investor, are they worth the trouble? So we'll go through some options on this next slide, this next very busy slide that Shani created. Um, but why would you invest in this as an individual investor? Um, and I'm pretty skeptical about them because here's the problem. Number one, all of these different products that we can, that we can look at, all of these different products have very high fees in general. And we have um, you can see some of our ratings. We don't rate most of them very highly. Um, so our manager research team rates them. Um, we don't rate most of them very highly because of these fees. And I think 
what you need to do, in my opinion, is figure out as an investor, like we can think about all these very fancy strategies and everything else. As an investor, there are ways that I can achieve the exact same outcome without having to pay this huge fees. So what are alternatives to alternatives, which I like? Um, so cash. I think people underestimate what cash can do in a portfolio. So if you want to up the amount of cash you hold, you are creating downside protection for you, right? You know, you don't have to go long, short different parts of the market. You can just hold more cash if you're really worried about the market going down. Um, time horizon. Think about your actual time horizon. Now, there are certain situations where um, you want a lower volatility, namely as you're going into retirement. But at the end of the day, um, you can, using something like our bucket portfolios or the bucket method, it's not just ours, but um, using the bucket method where you're holding cash to insulate you from market falls, meaning you don't have to sell your assets, cash can be used as a, uh, in that case, as part of a bucket portfolio to extend this time horizon you have if you're very worried about short-term volatility. Diversification, there are lots of ways that you can diversify in somewhat similar ways to, uh, to these long short strategy or to, uh, to some of these alternative strategies. If we're trying to create a portfolio with lower correlations, we can still find assets that have lower correlations, right? You can find them even looking in different sectors within the equity market, you know, Timberland was something that was loved and is loved by a lot of these, um, a lot of these sort of endowment managers. Um, but you can buy publicly traded timber companies. Now, the price is going to bounce around. But if you don't care about that and think about the asset and think about your trees growing, while the price goes down, then uh, then yeah, you can think longer term. Um, so yeah, if you're trying to actually invest in one of these things. Think about both of these. Um, think about both of these factors. Find a good manager, and you know my argument, my cynical argument would be: Can you get access to a good manager? Right. So even there are hedge fund managers that have amazing track records. They're also not going to take my money because I don't have enough. Um, so nobody wants to go out and raise money and work hard to get a bunch of you know retail investors to invest in them. They'd rather just go get all that money from one person. It's easier right? At the end of the day. So are you going to get access to the best managers? Probably not, unless you have a lot of money. And then remember that depending upon market conditions, different ones of these strategies, different strategies will perform in different ways. So we just listed um, a bunch of the liquid alternatives. So basically alternative funds that you can go buy. Now, one thing that you should look at the minimum on many of these is pretty high. So basically, when Chani says platform, it means you need to go onto a platform to buy that one. Listed means there's no um, minimum. You can just go out and buy this thing. Um, now, the minimum would be how much you want to pay for a transaction cost. You see the minimums are, are quite high. And once again, you know, not that many of them have earned a decent rating from our analysts. Um, but we've got these diversifiers, so diversifiers being more um, real outcome, absolute return. They're trying to get an absolute return. They're not trying to beat the market or anything like that. They're trying to get an absolute return, positive return in any market environment. And then, yeah, we've got all these opportunistic ones. So basically that's just an active manager that's going for it. Um, that's using more complex strategies, right? We've got futures, things like that, et cetera. All right, so we actually have some questions. Hopefully they're mostly about chips. Um, and I'll do that in a second. So Rodney's saying, note that the Ardea Real Outcome Fund is available as an ETF. Okay. Don't you think, Shani, that Rodney should just come and do these things? Yeah. Yeah, it would make my life easier. Um, all right. So we've got a question about hybrids. So talk about hybrids. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about hybrids. Now, hybrids are not an alternative investment. So what a hybrid is, is a hybrid is a security that has um, characteristics of equities and characteristics of debt. 
It's not fully either one of them. So basically a hybrid or in the US, they're called preferred, preferred shares. Um, a hybrid is something that's pretty popular with people looking for income. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, they've generally got better yields than a share would. Number two, you also get franking credits. People love franking credits. And because of the way, um, because of how banks and banks have a lot of regulation around the amount of capital that they need to hold um, to protect them from losses, people not paying them back, um, just because of some of those capital accords and capital regulations, hybrids are really popular with banks. Um, so they issue a lot of hybrids. So what you'll get generally with a hybrid is you'll get higher income, you'll get your franking credits, and you're going to get lower volatility than you would as part of that, as just buying the equity. Um, and so you have less upside, but you have more protection and more income. So they're pretty popular with retirees. Um, you know, the reason for that is basically that there are um, conditions with which you would convert that. Um, so the bank would be able to convert that into equity. Um, all right. And we've got two things. Oh, I've got some good questions. Oh, my quote was Groucho Marx. Who did I say it was? Do you remember who I said? I said Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah, he's like the guy that says, I don't get no respect. I'm teaching Shani about old white men. Um, so you've got this other question. If you still have long working life and a mortgage, paying down your mortgage and holding it in an offset redraw would seem like a guaranteed return on your cash. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, I think it's a I think it's an interesting thing. It's always it's always interesting looking at, you know, what you should do with a mortgage, whether you should really focus on paying it off, whether you should focus on investing instead of your mortgage. And a lot of it obviously is around that interest rate, right? So at the end of the day, if you are making payments in excess of your required payments on your mortgage, what you're doing is you're paying off principal. Now, the principal is, of course, what you borrowed in the first place. So you know, it's adding to the value of your house, or it's adding to the amount that you own of your house, but it's the amount that you borrowed. And the cost, of course, of borrowing it is that interest rate. So really the trade-off and their tax consequences and all sorts of things you need to consider. But really the trade-off is, do you think you can beat that return, um, that interest rate that you're paying on your mortgage? Um, so it's an interesting one because mortgages, um, yeah, the interesting thing about a mortgage is mortgage is like you can keep paying off the principal, paying off the principal, paying off the principal. At some point, you get this huge payout, and that's when you paid it off completely, and then all of a sudden your mortgage goes away. But up until that point, yeah, you're still uh, you're still paying. All right, so I think we're going to end this thing here. Um, just to put this out of its misery, um, Shani's finished her chips, so she's no longer interested. Um, but thank you guys for joining. If anyone has any questions, you can email me at mark.lamonica1 at morningstar.com. So we'll be back on Tuesday. We're going to talk about how to find a share that's right for you, which I think should be an interesting one, I hope. So anyway, hope you guys enjoyed Shani's presentation. But thank you for joining.